Long before the Buddha walked the earth, the northern part of Burma was said to be inhabited only by wild animals and birds of prey. One day, the biggest and oldest eagle in creation flew over a valley. On a hillside shone an enormous morsel of fresh meat, bright red in color. The eagle attempted to pick it up, but its claws couldn't penetrate the blood red substance. Try as he might, he couldn't grasp it. After many attempts, at last he understood. It wasn't a piece of meat, but a sacred and peerless stone made from the fire and blood of the earth itself. The stone was the first ruby on earth, and the valley was Mukuk. I'd like to show you this ruby necklace. The rubies are very beautiful. They're pigeon's blood, which is the rarest color of ruby. They come from Burma. Myanmar, the land of golden rubies, situated at the Tropic of Cancer between the Indian subcontinent and East Asia, has a population of 44 million, predominantly Buddhist. In the capital city of Rangoon, the great Shwedagon Pagoda is believed to have been built in Buddha's time. The gold and precious stones with which it is covered are the offerings of devotees over the centuries. 5,448 diamonds, including one of 76 carats and 2,377 of the finest colored rubies adorn its spire. Most of these stones come from the remote mountainous regions of the north, near the Chinese border. In the Shan Plateau, the red stone has been extracted since prehistoric times. Along the ruby route lies the ancient city of Pagan, with its plain of a thousand pagodas. Its foundation is believed to originate from a prophecy of Buddha, who declared one day, 651 days following my ascension into Nirvana, a great kingdom will rise up on this spot. From the 11th century onwards, no less than 13,000 temples, pagodas, and stupas have been built around the Irrawaddy River. Seven centuries later, a third of the royal city was swept away in a great flood. Diverse offerings to Buddha were placed in the stupas and temples, and these sometimes included rubies. Certain gem dealers in Pagan offer stones that supposedly come from the ruins of these temples that are forever being rebuilt. Despite their lack of knowledge, they assert with confidence that these stones come from Magok, the land of the ruby. Best quality is Yanu. In a temple, out of sight of curious eyes, observed only by their god, they reveal their treasure. Pigeon blood, no? Timbless. <laughs> You know what is pigeon blood? So it's the best color? Best color. From Mogok? Yes. A big stone. Yeah. It's difficult to find stone like that, no? Yeah, it's difficult to find. But I think that's too expensive for me, no? Yeah, too no? expensive. <laughs> yeah. The other one is too expensive. Too beautiful to be true, 
and far too inexpensive for their large size, these stones take in many an inexperienced buyer. The ruby root passes through Mandalay, founded in the mid-19th century by King Minden. Here, sculptors carve statues of Buddha out of white marble. And it's this same white marble that, by a quirk of nature, serves as a matrix for the red gems. The Burmese king consulted an Indian woman astrologer to find out what the future held for him. His royal rule continued, despite his imposed exile by the British in 1885. You have two very important lifelines. You will go on a successful journey to Mogok, where you will find precious things. To help you succeed, I am going to give you something that will bring you good fortune. A few kilometers away from Magak, in the village of Polonji, begins the real ruby trading where only small stones are exchanged or sold between miners and dealers. Some of the stones have already been cut in order to better display their effect, like the star rubies, whose tiny needles of titanium oxide catch and reflect back light in the form of a six-ray star. Gem dealing is mainly carried out by women here. This stone's worth 40,000 kiats. <laughs> that much? Yes. For the canisse, I choose the soil where I want to look for stones. This stone was found through sifting the soil. At the foot of the privately operated mines, Women and children search for stones in accordance with the Kenese custom, which allows tailings to be searched by anyone, with all stones found becoming the property of the finder, who is free to sell them without paying anything to the mine owner or to the government. Under the British rule, this practice was restricted to women only. Any man who so much as bent down to touch a stone on the ground without having a license was subject to imprisonment. Gems found in this way are often small in size and are stored for safekeeping inside the finder's mouth. This practice, however, also enables the theft and illegal sale of large numbers of stones. On a site where supervision is not so tight, a miner can drop a ruby into the tailings area where the Kenesse is practiced. The stone will then be accidentally found by a Kenesse woman accomplice who now legally owns it. <laughs> so this is the place uh, I walk. Min too is a miner. He's here to make his fortune. The mines and the land are protected by spirits. The local inhabitants are very superstitious and believe strongly in the supernatural. Min Tu makes offerings to these spirits in order to gain their favor. They are represented by a coconut surrounded by bananas and are called nuts. He dreams of finding a large ruby, like in the famous legend of the old woman who, on a day of heavy rain, after having made her offering, sees a mass of fallen earth on the path in front of her and discovers at her feet a ruby as big as a pigeon's egg.
This spirit worship existed long before the arrival of Buddhism in Myanmar, and one can count today 37 different Nats or spirits who are legendary heroes. Offerings are made to gain their favor or to appease them. They are celebrated during the Nat Pu festival, and one of the main characters is the Nat Kadao, or female spirit, who attempts to seduce the deities with her frenzied dances, watched by a crowd of fascinated onlookers. This character, who is often a man dressed up as a woman, gives advice on everyday matters, as well as medical and spiritual questions. This animistic cult is very particular to Myanmar. The dwelling place of the Nats is an ancient volcano near Pagan, Mount Popa. Three years ago, this gaping hole was a peaceful village. One day, a man dug a well and found some rubies. The village was dismantled and relocated. Frenzied digging began in these gemstone-bearing deposits, transported here over thousands of years by the streams and rivers now diverted. The local name for this soil is Bayon. After being raked and dug, the Bayon is transformed into mud with water collected from the monsoon rains. And this precious mixture is then pumped up to a separating facility to obtain the gem-bearing gravel, which could make the fortune of the mine owner and his employees. The miners receive food, but their pay is based on a percentage of their findings. At dusk, the water is turned off. Under the watchful eye of the supervisor, the miners pick out the biggest stones. The ruby is rare. One isn't found every day. And exceptional stones are even rarer. The smaller stones are collected farther down below. They are transported in pans to a sorting table where the work takes place under vigilant guard. Around 60 million years ago, at the time when the Himalayas were formed, limestone impurities rich in aluminum and oxygen were subjected to high temperatures due to magma rising up to the Earth's surface through faults. This phenomenon gave birth to the rubies of Magok. Through the activity of atmospheric agents, the marble, which serves as a matrix, disintegrates. The thickest, most resistant ruby crystals are washed away by the streams and rivers and deposited in natural hollows in the valleys. These alluvial deposits will become the zone of predilection for gem seekers. In Magok, gem markets operate in the morning and evening. The larger stones are bought and sold amongst the local inhabitants, and this trading is, again, mainly carried out by women. The hour is well chosen, as the pink-hued lights of dawn and dusk show off the red color of the stone, which is further accentuated by the brass display plates. At the ruby market, a further danger awaits the inexperienced buyer. The spinel, a stone very similar to the ruby in its color and chemical composition, and which is found in the same deposits. Its former name was the Balas Ruby. The Black Prince's Ruby, set into the Royal Crown of England next to the Cullinan Diamond, is nothing more than a suburb spinel.
In Magok, fortunes can be easily made as gem-bearing alluvia from the nearby mountains inundate the valley. When it rains, the houses and soil are completely inundated. During heavy rains, you can find stones everywhere in the street. Women who haven't managed to sell all their stones at the market trade with bigger dealers, like Dr. Sanango. Hello. 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 These people are, some of them, uh, gem traders by themselves. Mm -hmm. Some of them, brokers. They brought other people's stones to sell here. Mm -hmm. And some of them, miners, they found their stones in their mines to come and sell here. Mm -hmm. And you? And me, I buy. I have a mine, but I have my miners. Mm -hmm. And then they work for me. And sometimes I go to them. And if I find rubies here, like people like you who came here, I sell. And sometimes I buy from the these people. The dealers employ brokers not only to sell their stones, but also to provide them with information on what valuable stones have recently appeared on the market and the prices bid for them, so that they can make their own offers in line with this. How much? 8,000 kiats. Uh, when I was practicing in a small village with the uh, payment of 450 chats per month, I have to treat the, the illnesses, including the accidents in the mines. And while miner came to me with the accident, after I treated him, he invited me to put a share in his mind. After one month, uh, he found a stone that bought uh, 300,000 chats for me. Uh, it's a dramatic uh, difference, huge difference in money. Because I can earn only 450 per month. And then only in one month, it was 300,000 chats. So different that attracts me infect me. <laughs> so uh, I went to his mine and became a miner after that. That virus uh, uh, infected me from that time to this day. The miners haul the white marble out of the pit in order to break it up in daylight. Each block may contain the precious mineral. This task is entrusted to a man of confidence. It's very beautiful and very good quality, too. Making their way along galleries that sometimes stretch for several hundred meters, the miners finally reach the layers of marble. They are now at the very spot where the world's finest rubies are formed, a treasure just within their reach, but which they may only contemplate for a brief moment before it disappears to distant lands to lay in a permanently locked safe, or better still, around the neck of a beautiful woman. A great deal of marble has to be broken up in order to find stones. This is what's known as a primary deposit. The concentration of gems here is much less than in the Bayon soil. The dust in these non-ventilated galleries doesn't prevent the practice eye of the miners from detecting the slightest glint of red. The ruby is the world's most precious stone, more precious even than the diamond. The crowned heads of Europe have never failed to set a red stone into the front of their crowns, in memory of the suffering and the blood of Christ. For a 20 carat stone of the best color, the price can be astronomical even if the stone isn't 100% pure. A single find of this kind can sometimes enable the mine owner to cover his investment for several years, but many months may go by without such a discovery being made.
How many got left? Uh, about 20. What? <laughs> and uh, how much is it? Some, oh, this one. This two? Yes. Uh, 1.3 million, I guess. 1.3 million? Yes. But US? US, US dollar? US, yeah. US dollar. Mm. It's mm. usual to find pigeon blood here? Not very usual. Only once in a year, once in six months, not every time, not every day. Sometimes it takes two, three years to find a very beautiful one. But that. <laughs> Dynamite is also used to break up the host rock more quickly. No detonators here, however. The explosives are all of local manufacture. But this method of mining is dangerous, both for the men and for the rubies, which are sometimes damaged during the explosion. After having been meticulously inspected, the blocks of marble obtained from this form of mining are thrown away into the tailings at the foot of the mining site. In the Kioksong Valley, the Kanase women and children are now free to search for stones in these discarded blocks. The doctor sometimes buys stones from them. Ladies, can you show me what you've got there? Do you have any small stones? Did you find those today? Yes, we found them together. How much? <laughs> give me a good price. I'll give you 1,500 kiats for them. No, we can't sell them for that, not even for 2,500. $3,000. $3,000. $3,000. Yes, okay. Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. Three thousand. I hope you find some good stones and sell them and make a lot of money so you won't have any debts. <laughs> yeah, that's the main thing. Thank you very much. You've made a good deal. <laughs> Bye now. <laughs> There's more chance of finding large stones in this Kenesay area than in the alluvial deposits where the sieves have already captured all the bigger gems. With a simple hammer blow, the miners can come across an exceptional ruby, but these discoveries are very few and far between. Where we go, Doctor? Uh, Dr. Pesce, we are going to uh, Bana, James Bana. In Magak, the miners don't heat treat the stones, a process that is used to permanently improve the quality of the color and thus greatly increase the stone's worth. The miners are superstitious and think this sort of artifice will bring bad luck upon the mine and their family. 
Only the dealers use this process. Magak rubies are, in fact, not easy to treat. Their internal inclusions are often not very heat resistant. To obtain the finest stones, we use a product that comes from another country, Thailand. I can't reveal its name, of course, that's our little secret. We can show you how it's used, that's all. Color is of crucial importance in a ruby's value. When the stone is heated, it becomes very bright and luminous. In order to obtain a precious stone, it has to be heated for 45 minutes. The stone then has a more attractive aspect and this increases its value. At first, the stone is very dark, but after heating, its color becomes much lighter than before. The rubies of this region have strong red fluorescence under ultraviolet light and are peerless in the world of gems. There are several different colors, and the finest and most sought after is the pigeon's blood. The second is yong tui, or rabbit's blood, which is slightly darker red. Third is a deep hot pink, named Bokaik, or preference of the British. Fourth is a light pink color, termed Li Kao Seat, or bracelet quality. And finally, at the bottom of the scale, is the dark red color termed Kalango, which means even an Indian would cry. It's mainly these lower grade colors that are heat treated in order to upgrade their quality. These small stones are cut here. The gem cutters cut an enormous quantity of stones every day, and this work demands great technical skill as well as extremely good eyesight. The heated stone is stuck onto a bamboo peg with adhesive wax. This style of cutting hasn't changed for generations. The machines are manual. The peg is held in place by a wooden handpiece to enable precise determination of the cutting angle of the facets. After each cut, the gem cutter inspects his work. In this town, gem cutting is a trade passed down from father to son, and one that demands great savoir-faire, because not only must the cuts be perfect, but the cutting angles must be determined with extreme precision, so as to avoid inclusions and achieve optimum shape for the best color. These stones cut in Magak are intended for the local market. The jewelry mounted here is typically Burmese. The jewelers transform 24 karat pure gold into a 22 karat alloy, which is harder. After melting and rolling the metal, they make the settings.
The jewelers also use blue sapphires, which are a gem quality of the mineral corundum, like the ruby, though less rare. Its blue tint is obtained through small quantities of titanium oxide and iron. Burmese women like to look attractive. They like to display and safeguard their wealth in the form of jewelry, which is easily transportable. They also use traditional cosmetic products like tanaka, which beautifies and protects their skin. This paste is made from grinding the bark of a tree branch and mixing it with water. Around five o'clock in the morning, even before the mines wake up, the monks begin their rounds of the villages with their begging bowls. It's forbidden for them to work, and they seem to observe with a sort of otherworldly detachment the excitation caused by the ruby. In order to become a true Buddhist, young Burmese boys must go through a period of initiation. This is called the novitiate. <laughs> For an entire day, they are dressed in princely clothes to resemble Prince Siddhartha Gautama, who became the Buddha, and are led by their families on the backs of elephants to the temple, where they will have to obey the monastic rules and abandon all worldly possessions. All Burmese people spend a few weeks or even years in a monastery, which they are free to leave at any moment. They must respect three fundamental rules, the giving up of all personal possessions, respect of all forms of life, and celibacy. All this provides a striking contrast to the quest for precious stones and the fever this inspires, as is illustrated by the legend of Gamuk. <laughs> Ngamok found a ruby one day and gave it its name. A crack in the stone split the piece neatly into two. One piece was presented to the king, and the other was sold by a merchant to the emperor of China. This latter made a gift of it to the Burmese sovereign, who noticed that the two pieces fitted together perfectly. Furious at this fraud, he ordered Ngamuk and all the inhabitants of his village to be burned alive. It is said that on the side of the road where the tragedy took place, no more rubies are to be found. The miners make even more offerings to their god than to their former king. Certain Buddhas sit enthroned on a mountain of rubies. This desperate desire to obtain grace through their devotion sometimes leads them to offer exceptional pieces, like this 50 carat sapphire statuette. But just as in any other community, there are always cheats who offer fake stones. This ruby Buddha, for example, is nothing more than painted glass. You can't trick a god. He'll give you back tenfold what you have given him. The choice is yours. Thanks to this offering made to Buddha, his teachings and his followers, you have the possibility of attaining the state of nirvana. In life, donations are a good action for everyone, and your wishes will come true if you earn merit.
In Magak, rubies, sapphires, and other treasures are the subject of everyone's conversation. In the morning, afternoon, and evening, and at night, the subject of everyone's dream. Man's passion for precious stones, fueled along the centuries in this region, still burns as strongly as ever. Just behind those caves, an enormous stone was found. Lots of stones. Sayado Ovito Keda is well aware that his pagoda is perched on a peak of ruby-bearing white marble in the center of the most prosperous mining site in the region, where the biggest stones are found. His pagoda, called Kyok Piat Tart, is legendary and venerated by all. Legend has it that an Indian king, Ashoka, in the 4th century BC, sent missionaries to build 84,000 pagodas and water wells throughout the world. Six years ago, the ambassador of Nepal came here and recognized the pagoda as being the last one missing from his census count. It's an enchanted place. A serpent once spent several months meditating at the top of the pagoda, and then an enormous swarm of butterflies settled on the same spot, completely covering the top of the temple. Despite it being formally prohibited, men have dug under the rocky peak to extract rubies from the sacred hill. In the cracks and crevices formed by the groundwater, the monk notices fresh traces of searching. The stone fever causes them to brave all dangers. It's here. Come, come. As well as being out of bounds to gem seekers, an old legend surrounds this underground site. It is believed to be jealously guarded by dragons. It's incredible. And the people think that's a, a thief of dragon? Yes, I believe. <laughs> yes. Not, not the scientific way. In, in my olden days, inside, some are broken and a very big hole that has a spinel inside, inside that. The people from here believe a very powerful dragon. And then that's, uh, I got the evidence. Dragon live under the earth, huh? because uh, these stones, these gems from the <coughs> mines digging again and again, we found inside. This famous dragon's tooth is nothing more than the fossilized tooth of a now extinct herbivore. Some time ago, some villagers found a tooth like this in a mine. They sealed off the entrance with a boulder for fear that the dragon would come out and wreak havoc on their village. Even in Magak, it isn't easy to view fine stones. Often, their rich owners keep them locked away out of sight and only reveal them to professionals or to people they completely trust. Here you will see very exceptional things. A 42 carat sapphire of the finest color. This ruby riviere, comprising 22 6 carat each pigeon's blood stones, is priceless. Certain big jewelers spend years trying to match up two stones of the same color, while this set has 22 identical ones and of the finest hue.
According to legend, a group of bandits banished by the Burmese king found some rubies in the valley and offered them to the king in exchange for his pardon. This land belonged to the Shan prince, but the king, seeing such treasure, simply annexed the region, compensating the hapless prince with a small piece of his own land, far less rich in gems. In the 16th century, the king decreed that all stones above the value of 2,000 rupees were property of the crown. Any failure to comply was punishable by death. It is because of this harsh rule that at the time of Upper Myanmar's annexation by the British in 1885, a large part of the population had deserted the area. During the colonial period, mining was carried out by the Burma Ruby Mines Limited, but without great success. Today, independent miners lease concessions from the Myanmar Gems Enterprise. The country's largest gem producers are the government, through this state-owned company, and the army, through the Union of Myanmar Economics Holding Limited, a public company financed and controlled by the military. Thus, ironically, the army is a competitor of the government that it controls. These military mines are mechanized and use technical equipment such as bulldozers for extracting the stones. The bion is blasted with jets of water at tremendous pressure. The gemstone bearing mud slides down into the separating facility, which is closely guarded. The soldiers do the sorting with the naked eye, without the help of optical equipment. The daily production will be sent to Rangoon to be sold at the Gem Emporium, which is held biannual. More than 50% of this region's total production of rubies dodges government taxes and leaves the country illegally. In the streets and markets of Rangoon, one often meets sellers proposing stones to tourists. The stones are mounted on a yellow metal that isn't gold. Well, that's a big stone. How much did you pay for it? $500. That's not very much for a stone this size. 
I'm looking to see if there are any inclusions or something which tells us that the stone is fake. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but it's a fake. That's often the case when you buy in the street. That's unfortunate. We're leaving tomorrow. You've bought a stone worth around five dollars. It's what's called a French diamond. It's a stone made by the Verneuil process. It's a synthetic ruby. In France, at the end of the 19th century, Monsieur Verneuil invented this industrial process that sniffs of alchemy. After calcination of powdered aluminum oxide, enriched with chromium to give it its red color, we obtain the raw material of the ruby. This alumina is sieved and stocked. A ruby germ is prepared and placed in an oxyhydrogen furnace at a temperature of 2050 degrees centigrade. In an airtight container, a tiny hammer knocks the alumina powder into the flame, which melts it. It's crucial to maintain the temperature constant because a difference of a single degree alters the crystallization. The melted powder drops onto the germ and initiates the crystallization. This is where alchemy begins. What nature takes millions of years to achieve Man will take only 16 hours to create a synthetic Vernay ruby. A cut with a saw prevents the crystal from shattering by freeing the tension caused by supercooling. These perfect replicas of nature are used in fancy jewelry making, watch making, as well as in lasers and precision instruments. Each year, two tons of rubies leave this factory, which is the only one of its kind in France. And no synthetics here, at the biannual Gem Emporium, where the biggest rubies of the official production are offered up for sale. Fufu deals in big stones. She comes to these auctions to find the stones that interest her. The ruby is extremely resistant and durable. Only the diamond can scratch it. The Hindus considered it to be the most important stone and named it in Sanskrit Ratna Raj the queen of the precious stones. A few years ago, a 52 carat pigeon's blood ruby of exceptional quality was sold here for $6 million to a Chinese buyer. The buyers are mainly Burmese or Thais. The reserve price is determined by an expert. Few Few has made her bid. Eleven thirty one, one bid. Any more bids? Reserve price fifteen thousand two hundred. Unfortunately, 
the stone will be leaving in other hands. I think you should try it on. Put it around your neck to see what it looks like. The rubies are pigeon's blood, which is the finest color for rubies, and tells us that they're Burmese, which is a guarantee of excellence. The Burmese merchants often say that seeing a pigeon's blood ruby is like seeing the face of God. <laughs>